thank you to uh, Asia Society and to KNMA. Um, I mean, we have this, the context of this wonderful sort of exhibition against which we have the, the, the conversation today. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, there's so much that we can potentially discuss with regard to art and education. I mean, um, and I don't know if, I, I think we'll barely be scratching the surface of, of how much there is that can be and should be covered. Um, you know, I mean, one can talk about sort of institutional histories, um, you know, of, of various art schools. Um, we can talk about, you know, state policies with regard to education and how it impacts art education. We can talk about the individual trajectories of artists and educators. Um, we can also talk about learning that happens uh, beyond the space of the classroom. Um, so, but I think today, because we have uh, both Rubina and, and Gauri here with us, both who are working and have worked in very specific and varied contexts and bring with them, you know, very diverse experiences. Perhaps where we'll start this conversation today is actually from those experiences and then maybe slowly open it up to sort of broader questions. Um, so the format for today is that we have a 40 to 45 minute conversation and then we open it up to audience sort of questions and comments. Um, and perhaps um, the, the first sort of question then to, to, to start this conversation off would be um, for you to, for both of you to maybe start off by sharing a little bit about the, the respective context within which you yourselves have, have taught, um, you know, what, what are those, you know, um, uh, have they been formal sort of spaces of education? Have they been, you know, other informal spaces? What have been your key sort of, you know, takeaways? Um, perhaps we'll come to challenges after a point of time, but also if, if Rubina, would you like to maybe start off? No, uh, people hear me all the time. I think we'll start with Gauri. Okay, sure. <laughs> yes, Gauri. Okay, so um, hello. It's lovely to be here, and thank you, you know, KNMA Asia Society uh, for hosting. I think there's not enough conversation about education and pedagogy, uh, you know, in relationship to the arts, which is why I was happy to agree uh, to do this. Um, I'm going to start with my own experience as, you know, uh, in teaching, but also as a student. Um, so I, I first went to the Delhi College of Art, you know, uh, and I was hoping that there would be a lot of students from the Delhi College of Art, but in any case, I hope they get to see it, uh, you know. Um, and so I, I went there to study painting. At some point, I switched to applied art, and then I finally, you know, in my last year, we had photography as a subsidiary, and I decided I wanted to be a photographer. There were no avenues, really, to do a Bachelor of Fine Arts in photography, and it's still not easy to get one in the Indian, you know, context. And so I then had to start looking. I started going to Triveni Kala Sangam, where I did a six-month course with O.P. Sharma, uh, you know, and then I started looking for scholarships, and then went to New York, you know, to the New School and Parsons, where I did a second BFA in photography. Um, I came back, and I had to also make a living from, you know, uh, I had studied sort of fine art documentary photography, but I always had to support uh, what I wanted to do. There were no residencies, grants, galleries were not even showing photography as, you know, uh, an art form. And so, anyway, I, I became a photojournalist and a photographer working for publications. Five years later, you know, because I work very slowly and um, often outside of the uh, parameters of journalism, I decided to go back to do an MFA um, at Stanford, and I also thought that it would help me to teach, you know, that when I returned to India, I could actually become, um, I, I, I could teach, and that's how I would sustain myself. Um, while in the U.S., I won the Mother Jones Award, you know, the Mother Jones 50 Crows, which allowed me to spend a whole year in Rajasthan. I had already started working, you know, quite seriously in Rajasthan, in rural um, uh, India, um, and but at the, when that money ran out, 
I had to get a job and I started looking in teaching. You know, I came to my old college, I came to the Delhi College of Art, but found that to be a photography teacher, they would pay me essentially, again, as a subsidiary teacher. And that would be something like, you know, at that point, so minimal that I couldn't cover my living expenses or anything. It would just be barely pocket money, right? Uh, I, I applied, tried to apply at other institutions where I found there were not many offering photography, you know, as a full-time degree, and, and often the hiring process was not very transparent, you know, is what I found. In one institution, my whole application was disappeared, which I had spent, you know, affidavits in multiple, and everything going back to class 10, 12, they want every piece of paper, and then I found... So, but I was lucky and somehow uh, there was an opening at the American school in Delhi where the, their photography teacher of many, many years had just retired. And um, I became, I started to teach middle school and high school students. You know, I ran a dark room for five years and I was teaching um, analog photography. You know, they supported it, a beautiful dark room, uh, sort of designed like a cave by Joseph Stein in this beautiful building and we really could make prints and and I you know I, I like to think that the photography department was a little space for kids to hang out mm. you know on campus where there weren't often many uh, you know avenues for kids just to hang out and do what they wanted kind of while also making photographs and um, printing and so on. And then um, I, I only sort of entered the art space as an artist. I kept making my own work, you know, and filing it away and only showed, came into the exhibition space when I was almost 40 and, and then suddenly it all became very, you know, busy. And, and of course, as a school teacher, you have to be there for the children mm -hmm. and you can't go off, you know, and be having exhibitions. And so it made me very sad, but I felt then I had to make a choice, and so I left. Uh, but, and I, I came, you know, into the art space. But in these last 12 years or so, I have continued to try and do workshops at institutions like, you know, uh, NID, uh, Ambedkar, you know, FICA, uh, I've been on juries, I've tried to do portfolio reviews. Uh, for a while, Sunil Gupta, Radhika Singh and I, you know, uh, co-edited a publication called Camera Work Delhi, which was very much trying to start a photography, you know, a, a conversation about, you know, a critical sort of conversation about photography and independent work that practitioners were making. Um, and, and yes, I forgot to mention that while while I was teaching at the American school, I was also doing workshops in Rajasthan, uh, you know, with Urmul Setu Sansthan, uh, with girls that I had encountered through their Balika Mela. And we set up, you know, and one of my students, Manju Saran, actually started a studio, you know, called uh, Shiva Photo Studio in her village, which in Rajasthan is quite exceptional, you know, for a young woman, of course. When she got married and had children, it had to sort of fold up, but I still am hopeful that at some point she'll start it again. So, um, so yeah, some, some of my experiences, I hope I'm not taking too much time, but just to say in 2015, I wrote an article, you know, when students at the College of Art were striking, um, and we went out and sat with them in support, you know, 2015, September, and I wrote something for The Wire, uh, and it was called The Slow and Steady Death um, of the Delhi College of Art, you know. And mm -hmm. I just want to read a couple of paras from what I wrote then. I don't know, I didn't have time to check now where things, you know, yeah. but I, I would be very, you know, curious to hear if things have changed and how so. Mm -hmm. There have been no new teachers in a long, long while. There are no visiting professors from the world at large. 
The curriculum and infrastructure have fallen further behind. For instance, students in the Department of Applied Art are still expected to do everything manually, as in our time, or to use Corel Draw. They have no access to Photoshop or Illustrator, which even laypersons know are basic tools today. They are to designers as oil and acrylic to painters. Mm -hmm. There has been stagnation instead of evolution. In the time that we have become middle-aged, the college is now a defunct dinosaur. There are three new departments in existence without enough teachers or any of the requisite infrastructure to back them up. For instance, the printmaking department needs printing press machines and rollers. The technical labs need non-obsolete computers. There is no Wi-Fi on campus. Visual communications need digital cameras, and not only the analog for which film is no longer available. Classrooms need better furniture, including desks and easels for each student. Better lighting, the campus as a whole needs a few workhorse photocopy machines, laser printers, quality scanners, and projectors. The building needs repair. The toilets, never a strong feature, are now apparently unusable. The gallery where the final year shows are held is permanently locked. And there are no basic safety measures in place, such as a first aid center. More worryingly, students from one department are apparently forbidden from walking into others. Interdisciplinary engagement is discouraged. There is isolation and alienation between students and teachers and students and students, general distrust, and the infantilizing of undergraduate and graduate level students. The library does not allow students to carry notebooks inside. They can carry in one loose leaf of paper at a time or use the lone photocopy machine on campus which costs rupees two a page. The library is open 9 to 5 p.m. <laughs> oh, yes. So, this is, uh, yeah. So the this kind of, the so, kind of thing, yeah. so yeah, so very quickly I would say just that things that struck me from my experience both as student and teacher have been, you know, often not enough conceptual thinking mm. and other kinds of practices which are not supported by even often rudimentary facilities and um, a kind of a very hierarchical structure, you know, in which uh, there was, there's not a possibility for students and teachers to, you know, engage uh, freely, um, you know, uh, and, and, yeah, and just without hierarchy, which I did find going to, you know, study in the U.S., that was one thing that did strike me, that both teachers and students could be very old or very young. And it was really about what they were saying and, you know, what they were doing. And, um, and the other thing I wish to point to is that not only, I mean, of course, this was pre-internet, but not only was there limited access to global and contemporary art practices, mm -hmm. in that I reached New York and I had never heard of people like Cindy Sherman and Jeff Wall, and it was like I reached another planet, you know, because we were still studying modernist art as contemporary uh, a lot of it and so but also I feel there was not enough interface with Indian traditional practices mm -hmm. you know why weren't the great teachers like Jivya Somji or why like why weren't great artists from other traditions you know including rural indigenous all those practices uh, why are they not part of the pedagogy and curriculum Yes. In the institute, in in our educational institutions, so just a few things I wanted to flag off, and yeah, you know, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. thank you for that lead because um, I'm going to just uh, talk a bit, very little about my student life, but I want to mention because I think I should be awarded by MSU. I spent 12 years at MS University in Baroda. Okay, they should have had been a medal for me for that at least. Uh, because I was a student of fine arts, I wanted I joined painting because I wanted to be a painter and I believed that I had the uh, potential. But then um, there was not a single student in art history. And art history was a department set up by Sheikh and others. And they were worried that the VC said that if we don't have a student for the fourth year, they will shut the department. So they shunted me from painting into art history. 
by convincing poor me, poor little me. Though I had distinction marks in painting, they shifted me. And Sheikh Bhai, I still tell him, he called my father and said, she writes great tutorials and uh, great assignments and uh, we should have her in art history. And that's how I was the only student in my bachelor's in art history. So you can imagine the advantages and disadvantages of that. But uh, so if the teacher wanted to teach, they'll teach or send you to the library. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or, and most times, Sheikh Bai called me home. So while he was painting sitting for sale, I was actually sitting there <laughs> and watching him while, uh, while studying, let's put it that way. But, uh, uh, but that was the trip that I took. And then I did my master's in art history. And then I decided I want to do something in education because I was very interested in teaching and learning about teaching of art. So I shifted to, to make my life uh, you know, difficult. I shifted to, from this department, you know, Faculty of Fine Arts, to uh, the Department of Education and Psychology. And I was, tra I was the only one who, was ever, who had ever entered education department from mm -hmm. Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a lot of fun was made of me. You guys are dreamers, and what do you do, and you know all that. And the the dean then, Dr. Yadav, he's no more, but what a what a what a man, what a remarkable educationist. He used to take my class by tell, asking me very difficult questions. So tell me, is uh, in fine arts, is there anything right or wrong? <laughs> okay, so when you when you studied in fine arts, uh, is it about knowledge generation or not? Okay, and he would keep pushing these questions at me and somewhere all that was making sense because whatever I had not articulated as a student when I was learning art history, I was forced to think about every little thing then about what this softer discipline called fine arts is, you know. What happens here when people come to train as painters, sculptors uh, and, and so on. And uh, I spent a lot of time there too. I did my BA, then I taught in schools, then I did my MED, then I did my Master of Philosophy. So I did a lot of work in education because I got interested in curriculum development and you know working on teaching modules and stuff. And that's when I got my first job, which is in 1990. And I thought, oh, Jamia has offered me a job. Let me go and have my interviews done because this that was the only place I'd heard had an art education department along with, uh, you know, painting and sculpture and other things. And I must say a lot of my students and my colleagues are sitting here uh, whom I have taught. And um, so I landed up in 1990 over there and I realized that though teaching is such an exhilarating concept and so exciting, and it is, uh, but there are challenges on the ground which are I mean, which are which are which you have not thought about. For instance, when I landed in uh, uh, in Jamia, uh, Nuzrat was going for her PhD, and so all the classes were handed down to me from bachelor's to master's to art education, literally filling up my timetable. And I realized that these students came from very different backgrounds, very unfamiliar backgrounds. Some of them even came to me and said they had never seen a library. They had never visited a library. They did not know about books. They had no uh, culture of books, so to say, that they were exposed to. And whenever I started teaching, I realized that there was an issue of language. And that language issue was so uh, huge because uh, uh, it was difficult for them to comprehend art historical terms or art history in just pure English in that sense, in speaking English. So I decided that I will use my background of knowing Urdu, knowing Hindi, knowing Gujarati, knowing English, and made a Khichdi language, but I taught exactly like that. And that really started percolating in one sense that yes, students started responding, otherwise they were so passive in the class that one would not understand whether this transmission was ever happening or not. Secondly, I also realized that uh, coming from certain cultural backgrounds, it was very difficult for them to see a nude painting on the wall, if I put visuals. And therefore, the culture of showing slides was not there and not really taken off. So literally, I started preparing slides because I thought there's no point of teaching art history without a visual image, okay? And to get them around uh, to liking to learn from an image was another kind of exercise to be done. And uh, 
I took that on because I was very interested in building that kind of a library for the for the department where where they could have uh, slides, uh, you know, uh, audio visual available to them. And uh, third was that I found that the curriculum was too prescriptive. It was something like they took great pride in saying that this has been handed down from Baroda and from Shanti Niketan. And, and you know, and, uh, uh, and I started looking at those, uh, uh, the curriculum. And of course, having artists as educators was a plus point because Ramachandran was there heading the department. A. Ramachandran was heading the department. Paramjit Singh was there and several other artists, educators were there. But it seemed that there was less emphasis on theory, you know, and this has been my observation throughout that what happens in fine arts is primarily the emphasis, whether I taught in College of Art or in, uh, in Jamia, primarily the emphasis is on learning skills, you know, and it is yes. so skill-based curriculum that... Uh, okay, teach portraiture, teach landscape, teach this, teach that. And there is very reduced, a very shrunken space for any kind of conceptual thinking or, uh, you know, talking about, uh, you know, uh, knowledge or talk, sensitizing people with, you know, different things. That, that is a very reduced role that is there. It is there, but it is really reduced. So what happened was, because of this skill-driven curriculum and because... I also realize the reason for such a skill-driven curriculum is because evaluation is a question that every institution must face. Yeah. How do you assess students? What will you evaluate? Okay? There is no way to evaluate expressivity, for instance. How will you evaluate? Okay? Though we always know from performance art and many other disciplines, is it taught or is it learned? Okay? The, the Pandit may sing a raga, the student, all others, all students perform it differently or learn it differently. So what happens in art? Is it taught or is it learnt? Okay. But in an institution, because of the way it functions, the evaluation is such a big thing that how will you assess and grade students becomes very, very important to them. So whatever happened beyond the skill learning happened in canteens you know, outside the formal uh, classroom structure, sitting for hours, okay, sipping tea, talking about everything that one could talk about, understanding students, their backgrounds, their talents. All students are learners, all students have talent. How do you take it forward, those questions? And one of the biggest thing that happened to me, because I can say this to you, Gauri, that I, I don't know, uh, many of you sitting here may not know, I must have taught in 10 institutions in Delhi. My, that life is over. But in Jamia, I taught three years, after which I went to College of Art. After, when I was teaching in College of Art, I realized, because I had a baby three months old, I was teaching and I realized that I don't want to do a nine to five job. So I decided to do two days of teaching at master's programs in different places. Mm -hmm. So two days I was at College of Art, two days I was at National Museum Institute, two days I was somewhere else. I taught at NIFT, I taught at Pearl. I also met a fantastic principal at Gargi College who wanted to introduce art history as a course. And I taught eight years at Gargi mm -hmm. College, uh, an art history module. And similarly, it went on, and, I, and my husband, Ashish, who's also an architect and a teacher, we both team taught at Shankar's Academy of Art. We pioneered the course along with another artist friend, Manikot Ranjan. And three of us uh, started a course called Art and Cultural Expression, which ran in the evening for students who could not attend college in the day. And it, I taught there for 10 years, we taught there. And it became a very popular course. It was run at the Dolls Museum, you know, the Dolls Museum in ITO. So these experiments kept happening. And one of the biggest takeaway from all this teaching was, does, you know, how does transmission of knowledge happen across generation or between generation? I mean, from one generation to another, does something change in teaching? Okay, or is it the same thing? Because as we know, even in this exhibition, you know, we are talking about artists who studied in Baroda and then became pedagogues, who also taught there, like Jyoti Bhai, Gulam Bhai, they all studied in Baroda and then they became teachers, okay? 
the question comes to my mind is when artists turn pedagogues what happens a lot of good things happen because of artists talking about processes materials many such things that they have experienced but at some point of time this is my feeling and my reading there is when there is a very powerful master a very powerful guru so to say or okay, a very powerful teacher knowingly or unknowingly his reality translates onto his student okay or his world view tends to translate okay and i'm saying this because at college of art i saw ramachandran and a lot of students who painted like him okay which he did not like but at the same time they did not know any other reality perhaps because he demonstrated how to draw he demonstrated how to he demonstrated compositions he dem it's it it's a very delicate line in uh, in you know when 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 artists are educators it's a very delicate line between inspiration and derivation you know what stage a student can stay inspired and where it will go to like kg subramanian he was of i mean we were all in awe of him he was absolutely a i mean the command that he had on speaking on teaching on writing on on his artwork on murals that he made in Bar we all were in awe of him it's no way that we will not um, t- retain what he's saying no way that we will defy him no way that we will challenge him you know and you know what happened i mean so many artists painted like kg okay and not because the artists wanted it it's a it's a very strange situation not because the artists wanted it i'm not blaming the artists but he's so powerful his truth is so powerful you know that it is so this transmission of knowledge is a is a very interesting thing how do teachers in such a soft discipline uh, transmit this knowledge what are those forms will, will those tools change okay what will be those forms okay so please understand this has been a journey of a, a tremendous learning for me because i just realized that we teach i loved art history when i studied it and i thought this is the best thing to really give to give to students you know give back to students but where are those opportunities where are those places because there's such a huge distance between art and theory practicing of art and theory that they never meet okay and that is also what perhaps the students suffered from because learning skills we realize does not take us very far you know that adage that we had that artist doesn't need to speak is not true anymore okay no artist doesn't speak his work speaks what in a college level will his work speak okay unless he has spent 40 years in art his work will speak but what will his work speak at that level you know when he's just passing out you know if if you just have to ch- uh, and the other thing that you mentioned i would also add to that gauri that despite having infrastructure despite having tools if you do not have passionate teachers at the helm those there are there are so many places where there is ample infrastructure and nothing is happening okay and this is really the problem in art education I'll, yeah, you could go no, yeah thank yeah, you yeah, i yeah. think i think <clears throat> just so much has been unpacked over here in 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 both of your sort of responses <clears throat> and i think what um, is is i think what i really appreciate is that instead of speaking about education in in just these very broad abstract terms i think you've spoken about it from these very sort of granular sort of you've given us a very granular sort of sense of what it has meant for you to be engaged with you know art schools whether as students as teachers and you know when i mean as both of you shared whether it's about thinking about infrastructure or not just infrastructure in the context of public institutions curriculum um, you know the relationship of art history to the other sort of practice based mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. programs um 
or even um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, there's just so much to to unpack over here. Uh, but maybe we'll take that that the point you mentioned, uh, Rubina, about sort of the transmission that happens across generations, and sort of thinking about artists as educators and and what sort of transmission happens. And you know, the you're you're speaking to sort of a generation of sort of educators, artists as educators, like say K G Subramanian, like uh, Ramachandran. Um, but perhaps maybe if Gauri could, you know, I could invite Gauri to maybe reflect on, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, what you're seeing among, say, uh, you know, your generation, your peers, with regard to sort of, you know, thinking about this idea of artist as educator, mm -hmm. um, if perhaps you could reflect on I that. Think, yeah. I mean, I think you, very good points, Rubina, because yeah. yes, you know, <laughs> it yeah. is true. Uh, I mean, for instance, I do want to take you know, to discuss this point, both these points about one, the artist being, mm -hmm. you know, actually teaching. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to me coming from a slightly, I mean, from the other, you know, a point of view, it's, yeah. it's a little hard to, for instance, and when I've been asked to teach, you know, at one point, mm -hmm. GNU said, will you teach the history mm -hmm. of photography? And I said, is there a possibility to teach it as a practitioner? Mm. Because how do I explain what it is to make, for instance, if I'm talking about representation, to me it becomes exciting when you are actually, you know, getting your hands dirty, so to speak, mm. and you're delving into those mm. very complicated and vexed, you know, issues around representation, or you actually go out and, you know. Uh, so, so I think that, you know, is is also, but but it's it's of course as we both have said, you know, the mm. focus on skills yeah. uh, can also be stultifying. Yeah. And you know, if you're just constantly how to lay the color flat on the chalky and get it absolutely flat when a machine can do that, mm. it's yes. a bit pointless, yeah. right? The other thing about yeah, I mean, I guess pedagogues, you know, artists being having this kind of overarching influence. You know, I was on a, a, a MFA panel at Yale, and it was extremely high powered. you know, I mean, everyone except for me, it was all these very distinguished, you know, people like Philip Loca de Corsia, and, and I remember thinking and feeling also a little, actually very sorry for the students, because you are in a space where you're still you know, very kind of raw and mm. you're trying out things and it should be that space for experimentation. And of course, Yale is also, it's a very fine photography department. It had a great person heading it, Todd Papa George, you know. Uh, I mean, these are figures from history, you know, so like in Baroda, as you mentioned, you know, uh, yeah. KG Subramaniam and figures like that. But I also did feel um, there is you know, it's almost like, like I felt even in the critique that it was almost as though it was speaking to posterity or speaking to history already, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's also like, it should also be a space for kids to play, you know, yeah. in a sense. And, and then I was quite grateful that I had been to Stanford, which also didn't have this kind of proximity to New York and the galleries and the market. And, you know, these very sort of high part, you know, uh, very, you know, great practitioners. And we had a very idiosyncratic program, um, which, as I also mentioned, was very interdisciplinary. For the first time, I had gone from the context of thinking myse of myself as a photographer, you know, and of it always being very medium specific. And if I might say very much about what equipment and how you're shooting, what, you know, which of course is critical because your form, you know, the, the formal aspects have to be like your language has to be clear. But suddenly I was the only photographer among my peers. And every two weeks we had to stand up and we had to talk about our ideas or what we were really trying to say, you know. And there was someone who was uh, making murals, you know, on uh, in... San Francisco, Margaret Kilgallen, there was someone who's working with ecology and design, you know, um, mm -hmm. they are now future farmers, Amy Franceschini. So it sort of, you know, just lifted 
the top of my head off because I just thought, okay, anything is possible and actually all these worlds can and should collide, you know, and, and suddenly I, I thought, okay, I can, I can also look at study anthropology mm -hmm. and gender and, you know, psychology, every, everything I was interested in, uh, you know, subaltern studies or whatever else. So, um, I think that, you know, that in a sense, yes, speaking, so coming back to, I guess I just wanted to, no. yeah, those two, but artists as educators, there is this, uh, I guess, this, this um, I don't know, if, you know, whether conflict is the right word, because on the one hand, we do look to, you know, say the Bauhaus, or say, again, yeah. you know, figures such as KG, or Shanti Niketan, you know, figures where, like, I like to think possibilities for s teachers and students to work together, you know, uh, but can this be, is this possible in a way, you know, that sort of, that, that doesn't then end up imposing another kind of dominance or, you know, can, can it happen with um, a lighter, you know, sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and coming back, you know, to our context, I would sometimes also feel, and I do still feel that it's a bit of a missed opportunity when you're in cities like Delhi and Bombay, and then you go into the art school and it's like another mm -hmm. space. Yeah. You know, and, and like if you go to Beacon House in Lahore, you know, as I've been, and you see people like Rashid, Rana, but also all the other people who were teaching, contemporary artists who, I, I just feel that discourse, even if they, even if they are not full-time teachers, but as adjunct faculty, as advisors, as people coming in, you know, as an undergraduate for me in New York, one of the biggest things was just what all the city had to offer in terms of people who could come in and look at our work, you know, and give us sometimes very eccentric and completely off the wall, mm. you know, like I, I remember figures like Duane Michaels and he came in and he, he was also very tough and almost, you know, <laughs> You know, I remember him standing in this group and then he looked at a young man who had like, of course, I mean, the work was also, you know, I guess quite mm. derivative and mm. very fashionable and and he, he just looked at him and said, you know, I mean, I think your hair is more interesting than your work or something. <laughs> no, 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 you know, no. As yeah, dismissive, yeah. which is something perhaps an educator would not say, right? But artists coming in and saying, you know, and there being space, I guess, for the institution to accommodate this kind of, you know, um, eccentricity and honesty and, you know, um, and of course, I guess artists equally, you know, in some ways looking to be involved in, in these spaces of learning. Because I feel for artists, you know, the critique that we get in a student setting is really wonderful and quite imperative because, you know, I've, I've been in settings like at Ambedkar or, you know, in, in all of these workshops I was mentioning and mm -hmm. it's really great to have a kind of very honest conversation even about my work and coming from this more pure space, you know, because sometimes the art world also I, I think has its own, you know, it's, it is you know, in some ways more connected maybe to other, uh, you know, um, uh, to the market, to, you know, to, uh, it has its limitations. So sometimes I feel like the frank discussion that you get mm -hmm. in a classroom, you know, with, with students is quite invaluable for artists and I guess the institutions should be, you know, but I, yeah, I feel really sad when I... <laughs> no, but that is know. true. Like in Baroda, I would say the, the, the things that all students, all of us benefited from was that it was such an open space, place mm -hmm. in terms of all kinds of multidisciplinary practices mm. and exposure happening. You know, we had a film club, we had uh, Satyu coming and talking one day of Garam Hava, we would have somebody mm. come other day, a Gujarati poet come and talk about poetry. That was fascinating. That mm. learning and that place used to be full. 
the mm. theater, the Ampere theater. Mm. And everyone would attend that. Even the ones who didn't attend the class mm. would all be there for these, uh, you know, th these type of learnings. Mm. The other thing that I realize is, of course, with the owners of, you know, India being independent and these uh, artists had the owners of really uh, putting a curriculum together in the 1950s or 19 late, uh, yeah, early 50s, that is when the department started, uh, also made them draft a curriculum of a different kind, okay? That is why my question about does it remain the same from generation to generation? What happens to curriculum and what happens to the transmission of knowledge as we go along? When things change around us, you know, will there not be a gap between where we are, what we see around, and what we are learning, okay, or what is being trans, where people, when we are all entering uh, Baroda school and there were 100 drawings a day, okay, Arpita said, I come also from that generation, 100 drawings a day. We all come from that generation of 100 drawings a day. And I found a completely delicate uh, or very empathetic teaching in Nasreen, which I always talk about because, like, she was just so different. She would not even draw or demonstrate on, an, on a student's work. Mm -hmm. She would not insult a student's work. Mm -hmm. She would not feel that I should draw and show something here or I should make a mark here mm -hmm. or I should cross it. With such respect mm -hmm. and patience, every student's work was seen. Mm -hmm. And that was another kind of, uh, uh, you know, thing that stayed with me about teaching, you know, the, the sensitivity towards, you know, that the teacher brings to, to her role as a teacher. And most times, she never preferred to sit and teach in classrooms because she wanted to, you know, sensitize us to the light and shadow. She'll say, sit and choose an object from wherever you find it, sit and draw. Or she'll say, draw this tree, but every two, after two hours, change the position. So she's also making us aware of where the light and shadow, where the shadow is falling. Okay, after two hours, where the shadow will be. Mm -hmm. And she will walk us into the parks in uh, Baroda, in uh, Kamati Bagh. She'll take uh, all of us. And she will be just sensitizing us, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. You know, as a student, mm -hmm. what is it to be, become sensitive to see mm -hmm. things and feel things that you normally don't see yes. or pay attention? One day mm -hmm. I remember standing in the balcony of the, in the passage, in the, in the college and she came suddenly <coughs> and she said <coughs> catch the wheel of the car moving <laughs> and I'm like what? <laughs> you know? and she was just talking, she just made us see, a uh, truck was passing by we were supposed to see the motion of the wheel <coughs> so things like that which at that time we, we thought it's easier to sit in a class and say object drawing Okay, <laughs> pencil, itna object ko aise, ah, then draw the object, yeah. then shade the object. And here is Nasreen who's making us pick up garbage from the, from the grounds. Mm -hmm. First thing, she enters in the first day of our college and she says, today we are just going to pick up all the dirt from wherever it is. All the plastic bags, all this, and she will take a bag mm -hmm. and she will take us all around. <laughs> Cleansing of the environment. Cleaning of the environment, mm. then cleaning of the mind, cleansing of the mind. I mean, it was extraordinary mm. pedagogy. If one has to write someday, mm. this is also pedagogy of a kind mm. which, which stays with you for very long, mm. very, very long than any skill that you have learned and forgotten or, uh, you know, rethought about. And I really responded to that. In, I really, I, re, I was so attached to her because of her... She was somebody who had that softness in her and yet she could convey to you or communicate in very few words what it is to learn, okay, or what should you grasp, okay. And I think that is something that, uh, I think your workshops, whether you go and stay with somewhere in Rajasthan or somewhere else in Kandahar, that is also from a very empathy point of view because you are not you are not dislocating them or you are not disrupting their life you are taking you are setting up a studio there or a workshop there it it means something else it needs to be studied a little to understand what is this kind of a transmission doing okay which is not really to bring everything under bring everything uh, 
under a classroom situation or a formal instruction mm -hmm. okay because there is so much learning in life also that happens very informally mm -hmm. okay we learn by informal interaction so much mm -hmm. okay so i think that is what she did she she freed us from this classroom panic mm -hmm. that is always to be in the classroom always to learn from the classroom audio visual lagao ye lagao wo lagao wo sab mm -hmm. she completely took that away from our life and that was the reason that so many of our students may have not uh, become abstractionists for because baroda was a narrative figurative school mm -hmm. of art but they imbibed many mm -hmm. such values mm -hmm. in their life you know they imbibed some qualities which are and i think that is where a teacher in art especially in art i would say i, I would say for other disciplines also because when i was in education when i was doing my bed or masters i don't know they put me on a thing that okay let's discuss a classroom or education without a teacher so let us go to plm program learning methods we will design these program learning methods and students must learn in the absence of a teacher okay and i realized that a teacher is not just an instructor who is supposed to just instruct and transmit whatever is the lesson for today the teacher is also a human being and she is a catalyst he or she is a catalyst and what she transmits is much more than just that instructed lesson okay mm -hmm. that is why teachers are remembered i remember my teachers and whatever i am i tell this is because of my teachers i had great teachers in my life i have learned so much from them i can't thank them enough you know even today i remember tks lakshmi she is in bangalore she is now retired but she opened my eyes mm -hmm. to so many things that i would have not ever thought about you know this that's the reason we remember teachers and that's how i feel that in art especially you know it's so important for a teacher to think beyond you know it's you have to take the student beyond received ideas beyond received forms of learning you know whatever you have received you just don't cannot just transmit that it has to open up for yeah. some critical thinking or some yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely <coughs> i think what you are also saying is that um individual teachers are so important. important they they play such an important role in in defining how learning or that transmission sort of takes place <clears throat> but also perhaps that institutions may also require to have their own visions and mandates for learning so that mm -hmm. it it doesn't depend on perhaps the idiosyncrasies of different teachers mm -hmm. but actually sort of there yeah. is a vision mm -hmm. or a mandate for an institution Very at true. large um i'm Uh, conscious of time and i'm wondering if uh, we are okay to have one more question or should we open it up for uh, uh, can we okay uh, i mean since um, rubina you did bring up the the fact of you know gori <laughs> having sort of mm. worked in context like yeah. uh, such as in rajasthan so and and we've been discussing the art school sort of but also touching upon all of these other sort of contexts and spaces um i'm wondering if we you know could hear your reflections on sort of the importance of learning that happens outside of the formal spaces of the the studio i mean it's already sort of come across in in several of the things that you've shared um but uh, maybe we can just start off with gori and and some of your sort of you know uh, yeah i'm going to you know take uh, continue rubina's yeah, point please. about also subtlety in teaching and yeah i think also you know some of my uh, i mean i was thinking of my advisor then you know uh, at stanford who would mm. say things without saying them and so you know or would never really quite say mm. but would ask a kind of question mm. that you would spend days you know just trying to think well what exactly and for me definitely going into context like say with balika mela or even working with uh, you know in in johar like with the artists you know the paper mache artists mm -hmm. i'm also aware of being in context where people have very low self confidence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and this brings me also to the yeah. question of english and non english worlds which also you mm -hmm. brought up rubina and you know and we are in india of course it's very siloed you know between the urban and the rural between the english and the non english mm -hmm. you know how far do, do these discourses permeate and i was aware that if i said one thing 
you know, they were always wanting to know from me what, what I thought, mm -hmm. you know. And so I also had to be very careful uh, because, yeah, I mean, I saw myself in that situation very much as someone just facilitating and sharing or, you know, making certain things possible, mm -hmm. but wanting very much to see what arose, you know, and, and yeah, so a kind of yeah. listening, but a kind of slightly active, engaged listening. Uh, and, and was it for you a more um, productive sort of space compared to your experiences in more formal sort of education sort of space? Yes, I think in, in the formal setting and certainly in the way that we are taught, you know, I guess in the classroom, more didactic setting, you know, where the curriculum again doesn't have that space for mm -hmm. making things up as you go along yeah. and, you know, in, in, in like the Balika Mila workshops, I mean, we were working in a, like the hospital uh, had a kind of a room where they used to develop x-rays and so on which mm -hmm. we converted into a dark room I see. Oh, and so I see. then had to figure out and the water was very mm -hmm. salty you know and processing film and so there were many things that you just addressed on the spot, the spot. and mm -hmm. collectively mm -hmm. you yeah. know because yeah. it became again very much a sort of yeah. <coughs> collective mm -hmm. process so I think yeah in our context it will you know I think we'll probably have to keep seeking out ways, mm -hmm. you know, while hopefully institutions and, you know, especially government institutions yeah. and so on come on board and maybe private institutions support them, mm -hmm. you know, but then also as practitioners, maybe we find ways, uh, you mm -hmm. know, some of the most productive things for me have been outside, even in the teaching context. Yes. For instance, I met Rajeshri through you know, a festival where I was asked, which was bringing urban practitioners to the village. Mm -hmm. So they said, will you come and have an exhibition and do something in the primary school of Ganjal village? And, you know, mm -hmm. and Rajeshi was one of the other artists. And then he was, you know, we each got one room in the, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. we were basically, he was making murals and I was doing, you know, working with the kids. And then he, I was living in his brother's home. And then in all those weeks, we started, talking and something completely different happened but uh, I think yes you know I did write down a few things that I think urgently like that of course scholarships and residencies you know um, to be supported by patrons and institutions you know equipment uh, for artists who need it you know film and so on you know if there could be cooperatives even, for instance, of photographers who come together and we, you know, you create a little fund and then film goes or, or whatever is needed, you know, uh, by yeah. younger photographers. You know, grants without expectation because too often in the Indian context, I, f I feel, you know, you get a grant or you get, but it's people wanting work in return or before you've even started the grant, you are thinking of what has to be produced. And you just need that time to just maybe do, you know, read books or whatever. Uh, of course, workshops, maybe the online space has opened now, you know, institutions facilitating things like portfolio reviews. Um, and then there's non-profits like FICA and, you know, Artreach, spaces like that, you know. Libraries and bookshops, I think, you know, traveling libraries, bookshops. Uh, camera work, you know, we were surprised how much interest there was, you know, uh, and actually how sort of, how, you know, uh, how it developed its own life because photographers just started to look forward to coming out and just being able to talk and share work, you know, and, and again, to have a kind of critical conversation. And again, I feel photography is in that sense has again been even further a little bit, I think, marginalized, right? I mean, outside, I like to say we are a little bit like the tabla players to the, you know, sitar or the more like, <laughs> and the not very, you know, I guess not the, but the accompanist in a sense. So I think photography, uh, yeah, we've had experience of this kind of, you know, limitation. Now there is a few spaces keep trying to come up like offset bookshop, 
or you know we now have the Chennai Biennale. Uh, but again, you know there should be multiple sites, zines, you know, um, student outreach. You know, of, of course, Kochi does do. You know, it's wonderful. I'm really curious always to see what, what the students are doing in their Biennale, but you know, equally in all other festivals and. Uh, you know, so to create, yeah, these kind of spaces outside of the classroom, hopefully while the institutions catch up, you know, the... I, I want to talk from within the institution because I also feel that that question comes again and again to one's mind. That is it that contemporary institutions of art are going to be defunct because other forms of learning may take over? Uh, I remember, I'll start by saying that you were talking about photography, which was a subsidiary subject mm -hmm. okay, at some point of time. Mm -hmm. And I remember when installation began, began in India, there was so much resistance in many places that I was teaching then. And I, I once went to interview KG Subramanian, who, was, who had come to Delhi. And I, I asked him, so what do you think about new forms of art making, you know, so much resistance, people still want to think about painting and sculpture, but don't you think these new forms of art making should be institutionalized and made, you know, legitimate or whatever? I said something like that, I remember. And he looked at me in a very naughty wink and smile and he said, what do you mean by legitimize? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? He said, said to me, if I remember, if I know, artists only like to do things illegitimate. <laughs> said, okay? And I, <laughs> I completely uh, understood where, what he said. I was like laughing away and he said, illegitimate, remember? <laughs> artists are the ones who break boundaries. And he was so amazing, so amazing and so witty. He was such a powerful man, I can't tell you. So much learning from him. And then, so I, uh, then I, so after that, started thinking about, okay, now uh, new things are constantly, new tools of making, mm -hmm. new ways of making art, new ways of addressing art making, new content, you know, all is coming and art, the art uh, discipline as such has not remained so purely an art discipline, so to say. I mean, look at people who now enroll as students of art. I mean, Ravi Agarwal may come from engineering, I mean, to do art, you could be, uh, Rux can come from mass communication, you can come from photojournalism into yeah. learning about art, someone else can come from engineering, yeah. management, there are all these disciplines that have come into the fold of, you know, uh, art making. And therefore, there can't be one master, one expert, mm -hmm. okay, who's going to then teach about art in institutions which are now functioning. And therefore sometimes this, th there, is a, there is a need for this to be addressed because this is an egalitarian kind of a space perhaps. It has to become open-ended. It has to become open. It has to allow maybe artists and teachers to come together mm -hmm. at times, you know. It's more participatory than being passive learning. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also experts from other fields mm -hmm. now coming into teaching of art or teaching, you know, or drawing these kinds of, uh, what to say, uh, uh, inter, you know, interspersing. What is this, uh, you know, art? What is coming from literature into art? What is coming from textiles? What is coming from completely something different than fine art? Mm -hmm. Okay, but still accommodated within the art discipline. So mm -hmm. this has to be addressed, you know, uh, in a way that perhaps that very definite way of teaching art or making art does not really uh, work so well now. Mm -hmm. Also the reason why alternative spaces have become very important. Koj is important. Yes. We are learning for new pedagogies are coming about, new artist ways of addressing mm -hmm. art making is happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, There could be an artist collective camp mm -hmm. maybe or something else. You know these spaces mm -hmm. have become extremely important and therefore collaborative practices of mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. are in fact I think the way you know, there is more, there has to be more emphasis. You guys are doing extraordinary work. We are drawing so much learning from Asia Art Archives. We know, we would have known Geeta Kapoor or Vivan Sundaram only as an artist, Vivan Sundaram. But I know that Vivan perhaps is the only artist who goes to each and every show. He used to at yeah. least. Yeah, yeah. Every show yeah, yeah, yeah. of a student or newcomer. And he would, if you go to his house, he would have pamphlets collected of all these artists. Yeah, yeah. 
all these student artists no senior artist i have seen take that pain to go to any students show which is put up but he used to okay and that's why the archive is very interesting it is revealing many more things yes. than just about yes. baroda or just about vivan or just yes. about yes. and i i knew this even earlier because many many years ago i realized this when i first came to baroda i used to see him everywhere in a very small student show so he would come give his view give his opinion have an interaction collect a pamphlet take a brochure and go okay and yes. kept it okay so the, so there is so yes. much that is there to really bring into yeah. the learning of yes. art you know yes. whether it is material whether yes. it is archives which are you know live yes. from another time you know yes. that okay so the, the way forward is not going to be just a classroom situation so yes. to say yes. it's going to be much more much more dynamic mm. okay where such collaborators will have to be brought mm. into yeah. and when i when i think about the museum also yes. i have constantly been thinking about the museum and learning and yes. teaching happening here and i realize and i say this and i'm sure it is recorded somewhere also i say this because i have been in situations where i have been at jnu teaching or somewhere else teaching and i i want to say it's a very sad situation that academia undervalues you yes. know anybody else teaching or any artist as teacher they undervalue because academia mm. is so there mm. okay and, and till that remains mm. yes. this insularity mm. which mm. you feel that de- mm. that you know departments don't speak with another institutions don't speak with one another national mm. museum institute will not speak with college of art college of art will not speak with jnu jnu will not speak this mm. is a real problem a real problem you can't just be looking down upon everything because you feel and for me for instance as a person who is heading a museum my question every time is how do i make this art meaningful to all people not just students of art all people who walk in here yeah if i am going to write my scholarship out they will just turn around and say who is now going to decode this scholarship okay i have to constantly think how to bring that kind of scholarship kaho jo bhi kaho make it accessible in some form not by dumbing it down and not by diluting that's really a misnomer i mean i learned when i was a teacher when i was studying teaching that my teacher lakshmi said if two adults are talking husband wife are talking and they want to transmit certain value to their child will they say speak the same language no they will have to translate and bring that language down for the child to remember for the child to understand so my first class actually i must share this in education was how do you define culture and say it in one line and we were all like way of dressing and custom and this and this and all those things and then my teacher said all learnt behaviors make a culture they are all non instinctive behaviors mm. that is what culture is mm. and she decoded that so beautifully that i could say that to a 5 year old and they will get get it what is culture mm. okay today we are doing just the other way round we want to make art so jargonish and so completely dense that people will come to see a visual image they are struggling to understand the image and they are also struggling to understand the text okay and that is not going to take anything anywhere people are going to run away from art the art is such a beautiful thing okay it is something that i mean i think our lives the only consolation is art that we are alive because we have something like this in our life you know and if you're going to take away that joy from them you know it's not going to that's why i believe that this empathy is extremely important whether in the form of storytelling whether in the form of understanding what the student has to ask not running him down not saying you don't know anything you duffer you know why are you coming in art you know this is not your field go away you know this there is a need to do this and this is why at the museum you can ask all my team i constantly say come down the pedestal we all are carrying this pedestal of learning but when it comes to transmission it has to be very humane Yes. if it has to touch a chord yes okay yes. and that's what i would say that it's 
contemporary institutions, modern institutions, whatever, the people who have succeeded are the people who were able to generously transmit, mm -hmm. you know, what they knew mm -hmm. and also kept it open for the others to critically examine it, to take it forward in the way that they, they wish to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to sum up a lot of work cut out for uh, all institutions and people, we have questions. Uh, Sonia, should we pass yeah. the mic? Hi. I know it's not a question. I have a few points to make. I hope I remember all of those. Oh. And actually, I hope I don't remember all of those because that will be too much. Uh, first of all, I feel that uh, this, um, when we think of pedagogy, and uh, uh, I think it's already been also said in some ways, but perhaps it needs to be mm -hmm. said in a very clear way. Uh, you know, wh what kept coming to my mind is this whole thing about when we are quest for understanding uh, philosophy or uh, religion or spirituality, mm -hmm. and often it is said that, you know, uh, one doesn't need a guru, the guru is within you. And I believe this is more true for the arts, for the learning of the arts or the understanding mm -hmm. of the arts than any other field. Uh, so in, in one way this is a bit paradoxical because I'm also saying let's disavow mm. the art school. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but since we cannot disavow the art school, we need those structures. And again, this will become almost like a refrain which I'll keep coming to. I think what the art schools need to do is to incorporate this whole uh, way of thinking where uh, the guru is not an icon, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's taken, I will not, I, I don't mean the guru or the teacher should be irreverent or should be made irreverent or less relevant, but to uh, also incorporate this whole thing about uh, self-learning. That's one thing. Yes. The good. second point I, which uh, occurred to me was that um, speaking about, uh, you know, uh, the, the role of institutions, now, again, uh, as others have also said, as you gave uh, uh, K.G. Subramanian example too, uh, art always is, uh, you know, uh, radical and subversive and subverting yes. things, and artists always do that. Uh, so this whole thing about going against the institution is pretty much the norm. Mm -hmm. And the same thing which I said about the role of the teacher, the same can be said for institutions as well. Mm -hmm. So institutions have to... Uh, well, I shouldn't be saying have to because it already has happened in many places. Mm -hmm. This is not new. For yeah. example, now there are courses uh, everywhere else in the world, maybe not in India yet, where it is a, a PhD by practice or, you know, so but that should happen. Mm -hmm. So where teaching can also happen through practice. Mm -hmm. The third point, well, there were many more, but I can, don't remember all of those. Uh, they are also going away. So this thing about perhaps... Uh, I also truly believe that most of the teaching and the pedagogy, pedagogy here is not just limited to in college or institution, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. Most of it happens outside, mm -hmm. and so residencies are very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having been to Reich's Academy, which was a wonderful place, that is a great model which perhaps we should have much more of. Now, how do we have much more in the world? I think the institutions which are in power or places which are in power uh, should become probably become better enablers even to find people. For example, you know, I may have honestly um, taught across more than 20 institutions, workshops, etc. Not once have I made any presentation of any of those in India. And even when curators come, they want to see the work, not what is done in mm -hmm. such spaces. Mm -hmm. Whereas abroad, I'm always asked to come and teach those. So it doesn't always have to be a very premier place and only then you'll be yeah. Uh, your teaching skills will be recognized because by just going to maybe a village and doing something or uh, designing your own course or collective and doing something I think uh, now how do the, these people, you know, artists when they're doing such things, it will just die out because they have to also survive mm. and after a point they will just give up so uh, institutions which are like Asia Society, like KNMA who are enablers uh, should somehow have some structure in place where uh, this becomes, you know, part of something which happens more often. Yeah. And finally, um, I feel one uh, very small thing, but which can be incorporated because this is how I used to do also, and many of my friends taught a little bit. So as a single individual artist, there are so many people who would come to me mm. and uh, takes so much time goes into 
being a sort of an informal mentor for mm-hmm. someone mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and after a point is exhausting and much as if you want to give it's you just can't huh? yeah. whereas uh, the arts council of england for example mm-hmm. recognizes that and plays as a mediator mm-hmm. so for instance younger artists who need mentorship will go to them and they will appoint or somehow you know there is a sort of a structure in so place so the mentor yeah. gets paid yeah. the mentor gets recognized mm. i don't know how many uh, unpaid and unaccounted yeah. for unnamed hours have gone where i have seen people's work email them back or uh, uh, they have come to my place or whatever but you know it's okay to do it as an altruistic thing but that doesn't last very long yeah of course so mentors also have to be these kind of individual mentors also have to be recognized absolutely. i think that's a lot for me absolutely thank you so much i think this uh, this point is very relevant and i yes. i'm sure there must be a lot of artists who are mentors and who really are also enablers and catalysts uh-huh. you know yes. whom you know younger younger artists really see their work get inspired pursue them want to have interaction and of course it takes up a lot of time i remember nasreen all her students used to land up at her house and finally she had no energy to put in her work so she had to do something like you know maybe if there's only one student or two student whom she wants to have then they will have you knock the door three times or ring the bell four times yes. because what else can you do when yeah. the, everybody will go there yes. and she only worked at night because she was teaching during yeah. the day this is uh, this is yes. it takes your time you do want to give you do want to share yeah. i think and it doesn't get recognized yes. either it doesn't get mentioned either you know yes. it's like it's just done because of one's own generosity and one's own passion to mm-hmm. you know uh, have these interaction but i yes. i think those two points are very valid also a phd or a learning by practice you know by you just uh, when role and uh, yes. you know by practice you learn and you uh, gain a lot yes and actually i also want to, i mean i mentioned portfolio reviews mm. it was something similar, similar. to what you are saying mm. sonia because i also you yeah. know we all have so many people write to us you feel very sad sometimes that yeah. you can't, can't give more yeah to every Everything, so uh, yeah. for instance mm. like through you know uh, daljeet is here from mm. sakak mm. so i'll go in when the exhibition of the you know the final year exhibition and then talk to each student about their work or you know so if mm. an institution is facilitating yeah at least you can, you say, can say okay say, two yes. days mm. and i'll do you know that's a, that's an interesting thing a museum can start or a museum a museum can, can begin yes. such a the course where you could have artists as mentors or artists give time yeah. and that's a time a paid time but they do get to interact so yes and it's a place we can always yeah so there is something else i'd like to say completely different but it and i've taken the mic especially for this because i want this to be recorded uh because this is a it sounds a little anecdotal but it's very important to say it at this moment at this talk it is about anupam sood yeah so uh, anupam sood's show is on i think all of you must have seen it anupam sood has been my teacher and this i think everybody i, I like to tell this to everyone i meet so i'm going to share a small a little uh, you know personal story about anupam sood in the context of what all a teacher can do and this is coming from what rubina said that one also imbibe the, the the teacher's life experience and your life experience sometimes yeah really influences each other so just to say i was in college of art i was in third year my, i lost my father uh, there was a i i come from a small town anupam sood was not my teacher she headed the uh, department of etching i had another print making discipline but uh, we she had taken a few classes during foundation and we sort of i can say became friends but we kind of you know i i would keep going to her department and mm. she would occasionally look at my work so that was it but it wasn't as if she was directly my teacher jump to 3 uh, years later when my dad died and there was a lot of pressure from my family to to um get out of art school basically because my father was my only supporter to be an artist mm-hmm. and everybody else like what are you doing why do you want to be in art school um and i weakened in that moment and i actually thought yes i have to be more responsible to my younger sister mm-hmm. my mother and i have to take a job or do something i'm quite sure that with time in a week or two or whatever i would have come back to my you know more sensible self and i would have done mm. the right thing but in that moment i really felt 
I, 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 was, I was swayed and influenced by everybody around me and I thought, okay, I'll get out of art school. So my brother-in-law came to Delhi to take my certificate or papers or whatever. He just accidentally ran into Anupam Sood, who, when, when he, when somehow they introduced uh, themselves to each other. So she sat him down, she wasn't even my teacher. She sat him down and spoke to him at length, but with a lot of passion to say that you should not take this person out of art school. You will be doing something very wrong. And so my brother-in-law came back to Saharanpur, related this to the rest of the family, and hearing what he had to say completely brought my own, uh, you know, resolve and my own strength back. Mm. And till this date, I will never forget what she did for me without even knowing. I mean, she was just being passionate about what she believed mm. in. No, yeah, I know, thought this needed to be said because the show is there and absolutely. we talk about teachers and... No, but good you brought this because, um, you know, there... Earlier there was this thing that artists became teachers because for survival. Okay, they struggled to earn and therefore they took up teaching. Okay, and I've interviewed many of that generation of artists, including Gogi and many others, who said that we struggled but we decided we will just be focused on our practice. Anupam perhaps is an example of a person who became an extraordinary teacher and an extraordinary artist, both. You know, she taught generation after, you know, batch after batch. Mm -hmm. I was there also teaching in College of Art when she was there already. And I used to spend my evenings in a studio because she was... And students have to teach and learn there. It's a hands-on thing, mm -hmm. isn't it? How much acid bite, how will you bite a plate, how will you scratch on the plate. Mm -hmm. Everything learning is happening right there. While she was also attending to herself. And she did both exceptionally well. It's not one for the other or nothing. She was an excellent teacher, a very generous mm. teacher and a passionate teacher as uh, uh, Sonia is saying. Ready to give, ready to, you know, just be there. She had problems getting permission to work late night. I was witness to how she was troubled and harassed in College of Art. They would not allow a woman uh, teacher, educator to stay there after 8 o'clock and all those mm. stuff. And there, there are many, many those gory stories not to be mm. brought up here. But she did it. And if you see the show, you can say the body of work that she created. What strength. She's such a petite frame person, mm -hmm. but the enormous inner strength that she carries, you know, which is yes. what translates into something, something of this caliber. And so I think teachers are, teachers yes. can do this, you know, this whole, they can transform lives. Yes. They do transform lives. Mm. You know. And I mean, that brings to yeah. mind Lala Rook. Oh, Lala you Rook, know, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I met uh, too late and during Documenta 14, mm. but, you know, in that short span of time, she already changed my life and ah. became a kind of mentor. And, you know, and I think when I see, when you think of a figure like her who taught, was yeah. an activist as well as a really fine artist, yeah. you know, there's such a kind of nobility about that. And... I think, yes, I mean, there's been a generation of artists in India also who have had empathy, but also public, public spiritedness. Very much you so. Know? And that, I think, is like quite critical. And you see it like in someone like Lala Rook. I just, you know, oh, I yeah. always think of her and how she must have done it for so many years. Right? And generations of students. And some of them were ailing also. And, ailing. and they were ailing. They were fighting their own body. They were fighting yeah. their own... Uh, you know, health, and yet they were. Yes. So, I would say that about. Uh, I, I remember Gulam Sheikh very clearly as a teacher. With uh, he just opened her eyes to so many discourses. Mm -hmm. That was my learning from him in Baroda. Mm -hmm. It was not just what we were studying. Mughal miniatures. We went to depth. Jain miniatures. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, folk art. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, this whole plurality, this whole syncretic tradition of India, yes. you know, it was not just that you can just go forward without knowing anything about, you know, what you're carrying, mm -hmm. you know, as, as your tradition, as your past, you know, as what can be taken forward, how do you re-examine it, you know, how do you walk with it forward. And I think those learnings were very, very powerful in, in his, uh, in his talks and, you know, his uh, sharing and interaction. Mm -hmm. 
you know, this whole plurality of uh, India. You know, it was not that because we are running a show on, uh, because we run a course on contemporary art and ideas, doesn't mm. mean that, you know, we cannot think about all of these, you know, simultaneous cultures, so to say, or simultaneous yes. practices, so yes. to say, you know. And I remember he, he was so passionate and I used, mm. I saw Sheikh mm. so engrossed, I didn't even know him then. I saw, saw him climbing rooftops <laughs> of different places to document this whole procession of Moram yeah. till it goes for an immersion. And somewhere these little things, you know, these mm -hmm. things then come into, not only came into his work, but it also came into his teaching, you know. He opened our eyes to so many things. How a religion also gets transformed locally, you know, in its practices and its rituals. Because it's not some, in Iraq it is practiced completely as a morning thing. In Gujarat, Moram is celebration of a kind. It's completely different in color and flavor, you know. So, <coughs> how do we learn about yeah. these things? So how things get localized? Yeah. Yes. How things get indigenized? You know, many such learnings came about, yes. you know, in this. And just one thing to this <coughs> point, like mm. I feel, yes, modern education we are talking. Mm. But, you know, in the Indian tradition, also when, and yeah. Sonia, you brought up the Guru Shishya, mm. but, you know, that the, there is also a kind of parent-child relationship, mm. right, which is also quite can be quite precious and I've seen like for instance with Jivya Ji and Rajesh Ji mm. you know where there's another kind of because he learnt with him and for many years and painting together and that yeah. kind of concern, concern. and closeness, closeness and, yeah. and, and and now you know I, I study so at sense of community a sense of <coughs> community <coughs> Yes, a sense of community and yes, yes. No, yes. I yes. understood. I'm just saying, speaking of yes. different forms of learning, like you yes. brought up the guru shisha. So my point was just that even the transmission of knowledge, yes. not yes, of course, in turn, your point was how it arises internally, but I'm speaking even of like. Sometimes the teachers who scold their yes. students a lot ah. also care a lot. Care a lot, yeah, yeah. Right? And um, I mean, I, I study now, you know, at Tibet House mm. and with a ah. great Lama. Ah, know, I see. The, and now their tradition, again, assumes complete responsibility mm. for the student. For the student. Mm. Which is also not easy to do. Ah, right? That's and true, yeah. We joke that sometimes the blessings of the Guru are the scoldings. Because otherwise, if they simply don't care enough to mm. let this person carry on whichever path, that can also happen, right? So sometimes that empathy can also mean that yeah. you feel the need to really intervene and to, you know, to But this, so. this is what Sonia's point I take because also like for, I gave an uh, example of Ramachandran sir. He's hmm. extremely learned man, very knowledgeable, I mean... You can sit for hours and have conversations with him on various things. Mm -hmm. He was teaching what he was teaching. You get demonstration of skills, kaho, expression, kaho, learning, where it comes from, Indian culture, whatever. The student's self-learning mm -hmm. is the question at the end mm -hmm. of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he may not have wanted to just transmit his style onto anyone else. It so happens that the student... Mm. Sometimes in awe, sometimes mm. in reverence, sometimes because of any not knowing more than that or not taking the learning forward, mm. you yes, know, yes. or not reflecting and self-learning, mm. then gets into mm. that. Yes, yes. And it just becomes like a teacher that powerful may mm. not be erased so, mm. or not be, uh, if not erased, not been, you know, uh, seen just as a... Uh, He's a medium. He is a catalyst. He's facilitating something for you to take forward. Most times that may not happen when mm -hmm. there is a. So this uh, somewhere these iconic figures, so to say, or author, mm -hmm. author, authoritarian figures, you know, that's mm -hmm. where the. Uh, but I had one more thing um, also. I Rubina. think uh, Kanchan wanted to say something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to say that even I was a product of Anupam Sooth, and mm. I owe my printmaking. 
totally to her. Yes. Uh, first, I was a, her student, and later on, I was a colleague. I wish she was here today. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, That's I know. I mean, I my head goes up when I see this show, and a lot mm-hmm. of plates were made in front of me. Yes. So, I mean, I give all my this thing to my guru that she was my guru, and I give her respect. And later on, when I was her colleague as a woman, when I was yeah. going through a personal yeah. uh, problem, she was always supporting me. But uh, just coming back to your point, Rubina, when you were talking about College of Art, mm. I couldn't resist talking. You know the story. The thing is that I taught for 14 years and 20 years, and I never had the paperwork of beyond BFA. I never had a master's. So a uh, lot of youngsters were becoming professors. I was never promoted. And after 14 years of permanent teaching, I had to give up college without pension because uh, they were mentally harass- harassing me. I was popular with the students mm. and uh, I could impart a lot of knowledge to my students. And that's what uh, at that time, not my previous seniors, but at that time seniors, they harassed me so much that I was just forced to give up college. But at the same time, you had colleges like Baroda who were, you know, so right now the college of scene is so bad, it's deteriorated totally. It's sad. But I just wish some, somehow the government institutions can, you know, sort of get proper teachers coming there. They just get the paperwork. A person can get a, a PhD from Merit and, you know, just land up being a professor there, but they, do, they practically they are zero in art. It's so sad, but I just could not give up uh, saying this. So it was just a point which I had to make. No, it's a good point. A lot of us are talking from our experiences, but once I went to Shanti Niketan, I think 10 years ago, and they told me that Shanti Niketan has a history of no women teachers. That was another reason. I was the only Can female teacher. Can you imagine? Teacher left. Mm. Yeah. I got a shock of my life. Yes. And I said, really? Let's start from Babu Mishai only. Let's start from. <laughs> Let's go back. And and the person who I was sitting with, I don't know her name, who's still a professor there, said they won't give my wife, who is better than me, a position because she's a woman. So please, this is. This is another, this issue, is another thing that requires a big discussion later time, on, but you know, can you imagine yeah, Shanti Niketan yes. does not have a history of women yeah. teachers. That's, um, that's we have, uh, Vibha actually raised her hand. Yeah, Vibha, yeah. 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 Okay, one question more. But there are, okay. yeah. I just have a question that, uh, um, you know, we are talking about it and thank you for bringing all this up because I really want to talk about these things for a long time. Coming from Chandigarh and then going to Shantiniketan, mm. my experiences are quite similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I want to ask a question, and this has been in my mind for a long time, that how can we actually improve? I mean, we have ideas, mm-hmm. but how can we actually implement those in the institution? You know, you guys have experienced a lot of things, and you have worked a lot. So how can we bring in those experiences into the actual institutions? Because, you know, we can say this should be there, that should be there, but how to actual, how to bring the actual implementation? That's wow. Yeah. Oh, there are lots of questions. Um, you just I'm, caught us, no? <laughs> you said you had to trap us at the end. How can they keep talking and not give some solutions <laughs> to change yeah. the world? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, okay, yeah. one more question. I, I, I'm yeah, nice. Actually, I'm not an artist, so I am maybe from a different perspective good, from good. what all you said. Good. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, a lot of learning is not happening. And she raised a point about how we can have good mentors. And I can just take an example from what we do in business. Uh, when there is a startup, or when there is a when there is a startup, there are now uh, concepts of what we call incubators. Mm-hmm. You know, and so in incubators, what they do is they have a s- lot of they have f- five, six, seven people, senior people who evaluate the projects, and everybody, all the business people, they come and they pitch their project to them. And out of all the hundreds of projects that come to them, they select 10, 15 projects. Mm. And those projects are then taken up by the incubator. 
and then the incubator for the next six months or a year, depending on the time, provides them with different, different, different mentors to give them different skill sets that they need to make their business successful. Mm -hmm. And from the art point of view, you could also have similar incubators mm -hmm. where you have different artists, senior, middle level, different artists, where the problem that you are saying that we have one very strong artist and his mm -hmm. skill sort of gets imbibed by default to the artist mm. and he doesn't know anything else but whereas here in an incubator kind of a situation mm. if you have different different mentors talking to them uh, during their journey and mm. giving them different skills not only how to paint how to work how to frame how to whatever you need to do it could probably change the way and this doesn't have to be done by colleges it can be done by private institutions lot of private institutions across the country today are doing the incubator business. Even the government of India is supporting business incubators mm. uh, and they're funding them, they're funding. Uh, and so these incubators get funds, they have their own funds and they make businesses successful and maybe then they, they get some money out of that. But there are people, uh, uh, philanthropists who fund these incubators to make sure that businesses become successful. So that's one of the things that I could suggest. And the other thing that I could suggest is that, you know, when if you go away from art, if you, somebody has to go and teach in a college or in any, any senior place, mm. he has to go through a bachelor's of education where they teach him how to teach, what are the things he should do, what are the things he should not do. Maybe we should have something similar for the artist teachers also who go and teach in these places because then they, otherwise they're teaching whatever they know and they're not really understanding how they should actually build the skill of the student and what are the things that they should do and not do. So these are the two things that I just wanted to add I, to this. Thank you. I, okay. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, I uh, would like to uh, ask you a question through an experience of mine. So I was recently giving an uh, interview for an assistant professor job in an art university. And uh, we were supposed to... Um, give a glimpse of how, what is our teaching uh, pedagogy. So uh, I gave my, um, my slide of uh, the importance of unlearning and how to think beyond the uh, box and actually think that mm -hmm. the guidelines are going to be able to take it on top and how we can take the art on top of it. So I didn't get the job. And uh, they told me the answer was that we don't need so contemporary thinking. We need to learn such things that we can learn actual art. So I didn't um, actually argue with the HOD, but uh, so my question is that is it more important to change the curriculum at first, the art curriculum, or actually the thinking of those uh, people who are actually making all these decisions of how the curriculum should be and what actually art is. So is it more important to teach them or the students right now? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Simple answer would be both, but uh, not even that would not suffice, I would say. But uh, I will take the gentleman's question because I just wanted to say that this is a, this is a question that uh, has been, I mean, this is an issue that has been on for a very long time. How do teachers upgrade themselves? Because the problem that we know is right from the grassroots level. You know, art has always been a subject which is, which is, which has not got that kind of a prominence. Let's put it that way. It is a subject when there's a free class, go and teach art, okay? And we all have been through that. I have been through that, you have been through that. So that starts right there, okay? Second point is, yes, teachers, they come from varied backgrounds. They teach what they understand as teaching of art can be. It can be drawing uh, diagrams. It can be making decorative borders for the blackboard. It could be, it can go on. There are many, many ways. Let's not get there. The thing is that academic staff colleges all over run teacher refresher courses. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me who comes to teach. That is another question. But there are such refresher courses for teachers mm -hmm. to upgrade themselves so that they can teach now, you know, something more than what they were teaching. But the, 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 the question that was asked before, which is like what Vibha is saying and some of the suggestions that you are giving, I would say to Vibha that education is a plant of slow growth, like art is. Okay, transformations not happen overnight. Nobody accepts them. I'm not even in that space anymore, actually. Like, I'm not teaching in a college anymore or teaching in an institution which is considered an academic institution. But I'm, my point is that it starts, first of all, it starts from 
a period of identifying the problems, identifying things that work, that don't work. In situations, in very different situations, I would try and test that, where what works. If that's a process, okay, which take, brings you to something. Then the point comes of reflection, okay, self-reflection of different kinds. How do you reflect upon it? Okay, before you can even articulate, there is a need to reflect what I learned in my learning, what was okay, that I felt was good, what was not good, what was lacking. And then gradually it comes to understanding of sorts that one thing we have understood that we are talking today in this forum is that it's not such a insular, isolated process. Okay, this process called learning or this process called teaching, okay, has to be multifaceted or has to be much more than just a teacher-student uh, classroom instruction. Okay, we talked about collaborations. We talked about... Yes. Uh, yes. being in alternate spaces, we talked about, now you talked about incubator learning, we talked about many forms of learning that can, uh, that can help educate a, uh, a person who wants to uh, be having a career in art or who wants to embrace art in whichever form. And that was my point earlier also, that this whole compartmentalized learning that we have been through, as someone mentioned earlier, if you're from painting, don't come to sculpture, okay, because you're a painting student. We have drawn these compartmentalizations. Knowledge does not have any boundaries like that. We make it a boundary by saying a discipline, because a discipline has a structure of a particular kind. The first thing we are taught in, at least in education I was taught is, we as human beings, the socialization experience is very huge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is a very small component of it. And knowledge then translated into a structure becomes a discipline, okay, which is even much more formalized. I'm saying from that formalized structure, you have to go to knowledge base. And from knowledge, you have to go to that big thing called socialized experiences or whatever those experiences are okay, in the world. And that kind of learning, which is not linear, which is not to say you go from here to there, because this is not physics. First page is matter, second page, page is, you know, gas, matter, solid, liquid, whatever. It's not so linear. Okay, if you go, if you take that route, your learning of any discipline or any knowledge base grows dramatically, you know, exponentially, because you have then ha opened it up rather than put it in boundaries. What is happening in our learning is we are putting too many boundaries. Thank God now I'm learning from schools, those boundaries are being opened, various kinds of, well, there's a lot of hope I see. There are lots of different things that are happening. We have a lot of, we have a very, very intense school program here. I learn that some things continue in the way they're continuing, but that gives pleasure to some. Okay, but there are some things which are happening which are very important, different kinds of conceptual learning, conceptual thinking workshops, you know, interaction. Earlier schools had such breathless timetables, they thought visiting a museum was not possible because the timetables are so breathless. Why visit a museum and waste time? Okay, they never realized as a student of art, I really, I, I could, I was waiting for the day when I could see Arpita painting in blood and flesh the flesh and blood, or any other painter's work, which I never got to see when I was learning and studying art history. So I think there is a need to put this thing, you know, out. Okay, today we are talking here, a lot of people would not even listen to us or call us where these big ideas are talked about in education. Okay, but I'm saying everybody has to make a start. So let's say that this will transfer into something at least, and something will start happening and that's the way it can be taken forward okay and that's why it's important to call artists because what they are doing what Sonia said what Gauri shared about her own experience as an artist okay and as well as an educator of a kind you know which is not about and let me say even museums for that matter contemporary museums cannot start on the base of we know it all you know they cannot start anything of that definiteness or such prescribed way is, is, is a question mark today because the museum must be a space of uncertainty. It should, allow, it should allow for speculation. It should allow for doubt. It should allow for questioning 
for critical questioning, for such questioning, anything. Otherwise, it's not going to be possible for any institution, for that matter, to grow. So I see that there is a lot of merit in calling artists to hear their stories, calling people from other walks of life to hear their stories. And we learn like that. We definitely learn like that. Even if it is not so structured, Viba, that we can put it in a course or a capsule, okay? Because every learning is not put in a capsule form. It cannot be put. Okay. Yeah, I think we have to be strong. We have to be strong in the immediate context mm -hmm. and in the relation to what you earlier said about. So then, you know, the alternate spaces where the museums don't become the comfortable at home. As it has already been extrapolated now that there are so many museums and institutions. And one of the things which hasn't been addressed so far is the stigma, and which is very relevant to pedagogy, mm -hmm. is uh, we're talking about models, modules, structures within pedagogy, but what about in this, uh, talking about this, the poor socializing? Mm -hmm. that, so for, for example, a stigma is attached when a person, a uh, young person who goes to an art school, in families usually is considered if you're not very good at studies, you'll go to an art school. Everybody in my family was very surprised. Oh, you're so good at studies. Why do you want to go to that? Yes. And you know, this is so internalized that it also triggers from teachers to students very often. Very true. I'm not talking about very involved few, but mostly it is uh, or very, you know, when you think that you're slightly inferior to the others, and that kind of negativity also translates. So I suppose, I mean, this is a much larger question. Yes. I'm putting another table now. Yeah. I don't have solution and answer, but one thing which the institution, museums, the two of your people in society as academic can do is better uh, put some things in place, I, I know you already have, to uh, sensitize mm. uh, people in a way that our education is taken a little bit more seriously. Yeah. So is it not directly intervening in making of the of the courses or the characters? No, no. But uh, somehow clarifying uh, it a little bit more. Yeah. So that I'm slowly, this will take a long time. Yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 I know, I'm sorry, yeah. but I, uh, I think... Gauri, you want to have the last word, yes. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> just to, Vibha, I just uh. wanted to say that I think, Vibha, that also you're speaking about, you know, the state versus the private, mm. right? Yeah, yeah, In yeah. a country <laughs> like ours, I mean, the state is failing us, uh, you know, and so other kinds of institutions like KNMA or private institutions or Asia, you know, the archives, they're having to step in. And so we are also having to discuss all these other strategies, you know, and we hope that, you know, but, but ultimately you can't reach that kind of mass, uh, you know, of, uh, outreach cannot happen without the government. So hopefully they will also, you know, want to uh, collaborate or they will sort of, uh, um, sorry? Maybe they will learn from the examples set by, sorry, I think, yeah, so I think... No, I mean, I, I, I think I'm afraid I think we have to sort of conclude at this point. But if I can just also use... Teachers don't the, stop, the, you know. Yeah. That. <laughs> if I can just use my prerogative as moderator perhaps to say that I, I think we all know that the problems of the institution are many mm. and that they are slow. Um, but perhaps we may also take inspiration from contexts such as, say, that we see in... Indonesia, for instance, where artists mm. have, you know, in, in context where yes. we've had either a dearth of institutions or where institutions have failed us, I think practitioners, artists, thinkers, they've all sort of come together. And I think we've seen it here as well, mm -hmm. you know, where people have sort of come together and formed their own spaces, context, you mm. know, they, they've created their own sort of collectives. And I think, you know, maybe... Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is we don't want to sort of lament or wait for the institution, but perhaps mm -hmm. also mm. take initiative yes. and, and, and do it in a collective sort of way so okay. that we don't sort of take these burdens upon ourselves as individuals, mm. but maybe come together and also not wait for the institution. Um, Very well put. Uh, uh, but if Finally I can now... you got to speak. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, but if I, can, if I can invite you to Bina to make the closing Okay, remarks. so I'm just going to... I want to thank <laughs> Gauri and I want to thank Sneha has been a patient listener and she's just thrown some questions and we went at it and thank we didn't you. stop and uh, great audience here thank you Sonia for your inputs Vibha many others who might, may not know the names thank you so much for this and I want to above all thank 
Asia Society India Center, Inakshi is sitting here, Ket, who initiated it, Ketki, Tarini, Avigna, Sandeep, Agastya, I don't know who all are there, Swati, Avik, uh, many of them who are all who all have worked towards uh, towards making this possible. Thank you so much, Tarini. Thanks a lot. I, I didn't see you. Thanks a lot. You've been you've been very active, and thanking Bloomberg for partnering. Thank you very much. And I think we should have more such evenings because we have a lot to say and lot to do. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.